Welcome to episode 170 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to share five ridiculously unhelpful things that I've said to students. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, or find our new Truth for Teachers podcast community on Facebook. You can share your thoughts on the show there and reflect with other listeners in our private group. A big thanks to Advancement Courses for sponsoring today's show. Advancement Courses offers over 200 online PD courses in 19 different subject areas for both graduate credit and CEUs for K-12 teachers. And right now, they're donating 10% of every purchase to fund Donors Choose projects. You can submit your Donors Choose project to them for a chance to get funded until September 27th. To learn more, visit advancementcourses.com slash truth. Have you ever been really upset and had someone tell you to calm down? That happened to me the other day, and it drove home just how spectacularly unhelpful it is to tell a person who is upset that they need to calm down. Telling me to calm down when I am rightfully mad about something just enrages me more. It has the total opposite effect of what's intended. And as I reflected on that interaction, I realized that the person who told me to calm down was simply parroting a normal phrase that we use, at least here in America, when people are upset. It's just a default reaction for many of us. It's not really an intentional word choice. When we say calm down, what we really mean is, I don't like seeing you upset. It's making me feel uncomfortable. And I also don't understand why you're bothered, or I don't understand the severity of your reaction. We want the other person to react differently because it's easier for us to handle. But instead of expressing ourselves more honestly, or better yet, allowing the person we're with to experience strong emotions and just sit with them in that, we tell them, calm down. I love to reflect on word choice like this because I feel like it gives me so much better insights into myself and into my relationships with other people. We're all going to have moments when we're frustrated and we've said unhelpful things. But when you notice your patterns and when you examine them, it can help you be more intentional about your choices. I particularly like what teacher and child psychologist Ham Ganat had to say about this. Listen to this 30-second clip of him talking. Does anybody get through parenthood without at least one time saying, how could you be so stupid? stupid? Let, let's take this into account. First of all, I came to the conclusion that our first response is not ours. It's our parents' response. We remember it. It comes, like one mother says, I don't compose these insults. They compose themselves. <laughs> they just which means, <laughs> what it means is, we hear in, inside ourselves the script that our parents wrote for us. And what I'm suggesting is, let's write another script. Let's be the novelist of our own life. Isn't that good? Our automatic reactions, the things that we say to kids without even realizing it, they just come out of our mouths. These are things that we are parroting from other adults. Often our parents or our teachers said those same things to us. But we can consciously choose to write a different story. I want to lead by example here and share with you some of the ineffective and unhelpful things that I have said to students over the years. I bet you will recognize yourself in some of these, maybe even most of them. And I hope you'll take this as an opportunity to reflect with me and think about how we can create a different script or write a different story so that other phrases become our default reactions. Here's the first one. You're in third grade. You need to act like it. This seems to be a really common teacherism because I have heard it said to kindergartners and I've heard it said to high school seniors alike. What it really means is, I expect you to demonstrate self-control every minute of the school day. That's the context we're saying it in, right? They're acting immature, babyish, inappropriate for the classroom. So we remind them of what grade they're in and tell them to act like it. Last time I checked, though, <laughs> these are all still children. In my case, they were third graders who were eight years old. Eight-year-olds, like kids of most ages, tend to be silly and impulsive and oftentimes illogical. So every time I uttered this statement, my kids were acting like third graders. 
They just weren't acting like the elusive, perfectly behaved third grader that I had envisioned they should be in my mind. What I wish I'd said instead is this. I know you can do better. I believe in you. Or maybe I'd give a specific expectation instead. What exactly am I wanting the kids to do that they're not doing? A simple, have a seat please, is much more clear and kind than making a random statement like, you're in third grade, act like it. Another one I said a lot was this, why are you doing that? Or similarly, why do I hear talking? Why do I see playing around? What I really meant when I said that was, stop it. Just stop right now. (laughs) But instead, I'm asking some vague rhetorical question like, why are you doing that? Or why is there talking? These are super ineffective things to say because in those moments, I had already decided that there was no good reason for anyone to be acting the way that they were. Therefore, I didn't really want to hear what was causing it. I was not interested in getting into a debate with kids. I did not want to hear them justify it. If I ask a question like, why are you doing that? Some kids are going to take it as literal rather than rhetorical, and they're going to give an answer. And I'm not going to like that answer no matter what it is. So it's better to replace those unproductive why questions with questions that inspire constructive responses from students and help them think about their behavioral choices. My go-to when I'm in the right frame of mind is, what should you be doing right now? This is a genuine question. It's designed to help the student reflect on their behavior and the expectations. Most of the time when I ask, what should you be doing right now, Kids will respond with either the correct answer and then I can affirm them, or they just kind of get themselves together and they don't say anything. But the real magic is that this question primes me to see it as a learning opportunity. I feel and react totally differently when I say, what should you be doing? Then why are you out of your seat? The genuine question actually warrants a response and it doesn't trap the kid into a place where there's nothing they can say that's right. If I ask, what should you be doing, and the student says, sitting down, but I didn't get a drink yet, I'm primed to actually listen to the motivation for their behavior and respond to it instead of feeling immediately defensive because I've asked a rhetorical question and now they're talking back. So it sets us up for a much healthier interaction. Another thing that I found myself saying that I think is ridiculously unhelpful might be something that you disagree with. Maybe you find this useful in your classroom. It would be in those moments when kids are asking questions or um, telling on other students, and I would say, that's none of your business. Worry about yourself. The reason that I think that that was unhelpful in the way that I used it was because it's not what I really meant. What I really meant was, I don't feel like dealing with this, or I don't feel like dealing with this student right now. And for me, it felt contradictory to the other things that I was teaching them about our classroom community. And therefore, it was confusing to my students. Do I want kids to only worry about themselves, or do I want them to help each other? How are they supposed to know when to pay attention to what's happening with their peers and when to only care about themselves? One minute, I'd say, don't just sit there. Help her pick those crayons up. She dropped them. Help her. And then the next minute, I'd say, do your work and let her take care of herself. I'd say, you knew he was writing those rude things on the cover of that book with a marker and you didn't do anything? And then an hour later, I'd snap, worry about yourself. That doesn't concern you. For my classroom and my students, I found that it was far more effective to teach kids how to address problems with each other. So if one of them was tattling on the other to say, did you talk to them about that? And then guide kids through the problem solving together. Or if they were asking me a question that I didn't feel like answering or I felt like it was too personal of a question, just say that outright. I wanted my, my students to be questioners. I wanted them to feel comfortable with questioning authority instead of just blindly obeying anything an adult in charge tells them. So apart from those few moments, I didn't want them to only worry about themselves. I wanted them to care about other people and be tuned into our community and our classroom. So worry about yourself is a message that I tried to be really careful and intentional about saying and only say it in really specific kinds of situations. Normally, there was something a lot more clear and kind that I could say. Here's something else that I said to my students a lot, and this one is so cringy when I think about it. If you don't want to learn, then you shouldn't be here. I would say this sometimes to kids who were being really disruptive. 
You know, that kid who just like keeps interrupting your lesson over and over. And by the fifth time you've had it and you're just like, you don't want to learn. You shouldn't be here. What that really means is I don't think I have an obligation to teach kids who aren't enthusiastic and compliant. And it's just not true. Our job is to teach the students we have, not the ones that we wish we had. I've actually taken the unhelpful statement a step further and said, if you don't want to participate or you don't want to learn, leave and send the kids to a coworker's classroom for an hour or so. That solved the problem of my derailed lesson. It de-escalated things for me and gave me a break from the kid, but it didn't solve the root problem of the child's disengagement. Now, I do think it's appropriate to remove a disruptive child sometimes, and sending them to a coworker's classroom can be a great strategy. But I didn't want to do it with a statement like that, to just say, if you don't want to learn, you shouldn't be here, leave. That sends the message that the student is only welcome in my classroom when they're fully invested in their learning. And that's really unrealistic, because every kid is going to have a lot of moments when they're not feeling that way. They're going to be off task. They're going to be disruptive. They're going to be having side conversations. I don't even feel fully invested in my own job sometimes, right? There's a lot of times when I don't want to be there and I don't want to do everything I'm supposed to do. So by setting this standard that if you don't want to be here and give 100% and be fully engaged and comply with everything I say, then you should leave. I'm not allowing space for any of us to be human. What I wish I'd said instead in those moments of frustration is something more like this. We're counting on you to participate with us. And we want you to join in appropriately. If you choose not to, please sit at the table back there so your group can keep working. You're welcome to rejoin them anytime you're ready. This way, I'm not making the determination that a child is not going to learn. Sometimes kids get sucked into a lesson halfway through. But if we remove them from the room at the first sign of disinterest, they don't get that opportunity to self-correct. By removing them from proximity to the kids they were distracting, though, they're still able to learn, they can hear everything that's going on, they can still complete the lesson, and have the opportunity to rejoin the group quickly instead of just being banished to get them out of my hair. Here's a final one, and this is another one that I'm really embarrassed about having said. Do you want to get a zero? Then you need to get to work. Another one that's related to that, which is actually worse, do you want to repeat third grade? then you need to get to work. I don't know where that phrase came from. (laughs) I think I might have picked it up in my student teaching days. It's just such a common thing for teachers to say. I've certainly heard many colleagues say it too. Probably some teachers said it to me because I wasn't very on task either. Somehow it just became part of my vernacular. If you don't want to repeat this grade, get to work. And the truth beneath it was really hard to face. When I say, do you want to repeat third grade? What I really meant is, I'm terrified that you're going to fail, and I'm going to be held accountable for it. The stakes feel really high for me right now, and I am livid that you seem so carefree when I will literally get fired if you don't buckle down and learn this material. There was so much fear inside of me that caused me to say that. If you have ever threatened a child with repeating the grade level or the course, then you know that coming from this place of fear and intimidation or shame is usually a really poor motivator. Very rarely does it inspire them to care on the same level that you do. It might get them back on task for the moment, maybe, if you're lucky, but it doesn't do anything to build their confidence or to build their motivation long term. What it does is it creates anxiety. All that stress that I'm feeling, I'm now trying to foist onto the child. It raises the stakes for a task that they already find difficult or uninteresting. In retrospect, I should have stopped anticipating problems in the future and just dealt with the task at hand. During the times when I was able to take a deep breath and compose myself, I'd say something like this. What part are you stuck on? How can I help? Something as simple as that is going to get the kid back on task much more quickly. They don't need me to escalate this to a situation where they're going to fail the whole grade if they don't complete the work. That just isn't helpful for anyone. Now, while I'm betting you probably recognize yourself a bit in this episode, I hope that you won't rush to defend practices that could probably use improvement. And I hope that you won't condemn yourself. 
Most of these are common teacherisms. These are things that we just pick up from schools that we're in, and we just say them on autopilot. These are not five statements that make you a bad teacher or a bad person. They're just things that I personally have stepped back from, reflected on, and then decided, yeah, that was a pretty ridiculous thing to say in that moment and not very helpful to my kids. Next time, I'm going to try to respond more productively. I can't promise that none of these things will ever come out of my mouth again. I'll probably even find myself telling other adults to calm down when they're upset, even though it was so frustrating when someone said that to me. These old habits really die hard. But I'm definitely much more aware of these phrases so I can correct myself and apologize if I say something unhelpful. That awareness is the key. The only way to become more effective in our interactions with students is to reflect. And I hope that my words today have been a jumping off point for you to think about some of your common phrases that could use replacing. So now that I've been vulnerable and I've put myself out there, I hope you will do the same. Head over to the Truth For Teachers podcast community. That's our new private discussion group on Facebook. And let us know, is there anything you've caught yourself saying to students that you would never want to repeat? What are the ineffective responses that you say a lot and are trying to unlearn and move away from? Your takeaway truth for the week ahead is a powerful quote from Ham Ganat, whom you heard at the beginning of this episode. He said, I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. It's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool for torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor. I can hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. Thanks for listening. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.